point, we'll move on to Mr. Alvin Murray, who is an agricultural consultant, and he will be speaking to us on Generation Z in agriculture. I know we have quite a bit of Gen Z persons in the room, whether by age or mind <laughs> or psychology. Um, I always call myself a millennial, and I'm sticking to that. Um, and uh, I know Mr. Murray also has some amount of experience in agro-tourism and community tourism. So I'm looking forward to hearing what he has to share with us this afternoon. Mr. Murray? Well, uh, good evening again. I'm from Christiana, Manchester. That's where I grew up on a five and a half acre farm that sent all of us to school. And it was basically, you could call it subsistence farming, but we have learned a lot. So no wonder I would have gotten potatoes as part of my name, being in Christiana. We might have been one of the first areas to commercially grow strawberries in Jamaica from that time at Brasco Lee. Yeah. And, I mean, you know, that was done. I'm familiar with all those good crops you have on the, on the board, onions, potatoes, strawberries, pineapple, you know, peppers. I've straddled agricultural extension. My main job has been transferring a technology, work in extension work, some amount of advocacy to the point now I am retired and I am now looking at agro-tourism, community tourism. But as we say, I'm to talk to Generation Z, and I was really hoping that we'll take the heat of the millennials who get all the blame as expecting to get everything. <laughs> and now I'm looking forward to see the Generation Z, because I started looking around, and from what I'm learning, Generation Z should be somewhere between four years old and 24. And I don't know if I'm seeing <laughs> a lot of people that are about 24 years old inside here. Nobody. They're here. Nobody. And uh, my last substantive job with Propel, we did have that observation where we had to divide youth in two different categories, 18 to 24, and then from 25 to 35. Because how do you help somebody 18 to 24, what do they really want to do? Are they really sure? Mm. Nobody, if, it's, if you're talking about land, access to land, nobody sees them. So I really came prepared this evening, you know, to find means and ways with whatever experience I've had in our cultural transfer, you know, technology, how we can do it. So I started looking at the ministry's website, and there's quite a bit of information. What crops are best to grow in Jamaica today? The information is there. I, look at, I, I took this one up, and here we have a summary of the different crops, and it, they have it by parish. What crops are, can be produced in a different parish, and they even have rates, like labor rates will differ in Manchester from Clarendon, and they end up with a cost of production per kilogram or a cost of production per pound. So you could start working backwards to see how many pounds you want to produce, mm -hmm. what price you can sell for, what are the current market prices, what are the prices different times of the year, and how you could make some money. There are difficulties, yes. So I went across, and I, there's, this is this on slicing tomato. The information is there. And all that you need to do is to really type in MICAF, production costings, and you get it. And you get different parts in Jamaica, the different crops, the cost of production, and it will go as far down if you want to work in the management of the different crops. So you'll have the regular cost of the seeds. It gives you the time to production, how many months. 
give you how many plants you plant per acre, the sort of top topography that, whether it's level, whether it's mechanized, land preparation, because all of that information is there. Different pesticides that you need to use, that information is there. And then it gives you your other costs, which some people don't put a lot of attention to. For example, if I have five acres of ginger, how much will I have to pay somebody to supervise that work? And they have worked on it to the point where the cost for supervision and management is determined by 10 to 15 percent of whatever is spent for labor and materials. So it can be worked out. In the past, I've interviewed people. So what would you like to earn as a salary? You want to be the farm manager, and everybody wants to earn $200,000 per, I mean, per month. I said, based on the figure that we have here, for one acre, labor and supervision, 10 to 15% of that, let us say the figure comes to $40,000 per acre. Are you satisfied to work with that? The answer will be no. So you need to go somewhere like five acres. Can you manage five acres? Can you manage 50 acres? And all that information, if you really use it well, it is here, and it can be a very good guide. So we need to commend the Minister of Agriculture, Mike Kaff, for making this information available, and the world has that information. But they go one step further, and every week I get on my phone which market is paying the best price for potatoes. Where supply is good, moderate, where there is adequate supply. And the prices in the municipal markets. So Montego Bay market is paying X dollars for, for, for ginger, while over in Papine, you're not getting the sort of money that you want. So people have that information and can move around and match buyers with the, the people who are producing the different crops. So I think that's a good place to start. And a lot of people are expecting, a matter of fact, the government gives that impression sometimes, and we have to be careful. Every new entity, every, in, every new group that comes to Jamaica and starts something in our culture, we are expecting that RADA can provide the technical assistance to these people, and it's not practical. We are coming from an era where the then Jamaica School of Agriculture that started 1910 would have trained people to satisfy the different crops. So you had a coffee board, you had a coconut board, you have forestry, and they would have trained just enough people to graduate each year to deal with the attrition, and maybe just a few more. So sugar had their own extension staff, Banana, they want extension staff, coffee, you name it. All the different commodities. Now, these places hardly exist anymore. And we're expecting that RADA can provide all of that. If you should divide the figure of 220,000 farmers, as Des Dr. Deslandi said, into 120 extension officers, <laughs> it is frightening. It would take some three years before that officer could see that farmer again oh if he sees about five farmers wow. each day. And it's a reality that we need to face. So not just the technology and the new technology we need to look at, but how do we transfer that technology? Under the Propel project, we had quite a few things that we thought worked, like a radar program in the form of skits and that provided information to farmers who were listening at 6 o'clock in the mornings. The farmer field school made a huge difference where farmers learn from other farmers. If you really think they learn from the extension officer, you have another guest coming. They learn better from their peers. Yeah. And I think we need to find a way you know, to start dealing with um, these real problems. So I'll add a couple crop, a few crops to what you have over there that I think young people on a whole 
and all the people when they have the money would like to invest in. So I would want to, as mentioned, potatoes, onions, and as import substitution. And I give the example of hot peppers. I would say 10 years ago, all the major pepper marsh and pepper producers, people who do different sauces, were importing their peppers from Costa Rica. And the government must be commended for putting all these nurseries in the different parishes so that farmers would get seedlings. And now, we, there's no need to import peppers for the different, um, you know, whether it is Grace or King Pepper or the different people who are doing it. So I would say pepper is a good example of tackling poor substitution. You've heard what potatoes have done. Onions are looking more technical. And it is my view that if we really think that climate is not changing, we are mistaken. Or we are Trump. <laughs> <laughs> now, there's a time when we had a distinct period where we could go and do all our land preparation. Mm -hmm. Now, we can't find time, we can't find that time where the machine can go in the field when it's not too wet to do the preparation of the land. So we need to add one bit of technology to that. We need to have protected agriculture. Even if it's just a lean to shed with some plastic, we need to produce seedlings. So while the rain is out here falling, and you can't do any land preparation, your seedlings are not protected in the area, growing so that when the weather improves, you simply take your seedlings outside and put them in. And at that time, matter of fact, even the best onion fields I've seen in Jamaica, you do not have more than about 70% of the plants when in that field. So you have lost 30% for various varieties. They didn't germinate because of, it was too much water, too dry, or whatever. But as seedlings, you could have a much stronger, and that 20% alone can make that huge difference. When you're planting so many thousand seedlings per acre, and you can get 20% more seedlings, that alone could make the difference between profit and a super profit. So we need to look at nurseries to do that. Tree crops, and I know the, the forestry department has been pushing that. And there is a program that people can access in Jamaica. You go and look for trees that feed. Yep. And my first couple of breadfruit trees I planted, they gave us them free. And some communities are going as far as the company will actually provide you with equipment to start changing that breadfruit into flour. Yeah. Right? So those are some of the things that I think we need to get out there. So tree crops. What are the good tree crops that we could plant today? I know it's hard telling a youth to plant a tree crop. And as uh, Madam Headley told us, the gentleman she talked about in the West is my good friend. <laughs> <laughs> and it is true. Right? He, I mean... He wants a trip, he could sell a couple of trees. And we don't realize the value of how many board foot we could get from one tree. And I took the time and, worked and did the maths. And if you did 20 vegetable crops for 20 years, you would not get as much money as selling one tree. And if you consider about 100 trees per acre, it would have been much more profitable. Wow. And I've done that maths, and it is true. So if you plant a tree today, 20 years' time, say 18 years for the pine, honestly, you'll be in good business. All right? So tree crops, coconuts, an excellent choice in terms of coconut water, which is better, a soda or a coconut water? What's the price? Compare them. Coconut oil, people are... Forget the studies that other people paid to do and we didn't pay to do. So they told us that coconut oil was not good for us. Yeah. Now we know yeah. completely yeah. otherwise. Yeah. <laughs> so coconut. Can you imagine you have a tree that's going to produce you maybe six to ten nuts every month? You have a hundred of them per acre. 
the difference that can make? Wow. So coconut water and coconut oil can make a huge difference. What is hard telling the youth to plant coconuts, he's going to wait a couple of years before he eats the first fruit, while he need to eat. But I'll give you that story when I come near to that. There are some other crops, I mean, livestock, because I've done quite a bit with livestock, pigs, chickens, goat, cattle to a lesser extent. Chickens are still good. And I see our broiler companies have gotten very smart. A few years ago, the broiler companies literally hogged the market. But they have now recognized that they need numbers. So small people are doing about somewhere between 25 and 40 percent of all the chickens produced in Jamaica today. And that is good because they need these numbers to fight. You know why? Chicken meat still has to be protected by 256 percent duty. If not, smart Alec could just bring it into the country. Mm. Potatoes protected by 46% duty. And many vegetable crops by over 100% duty. But like that, this land was explaining before. Yes. But the truth is, and I will never forget the story where I saw it was President Bush explaining made in America. And one of his aides was busy taping up the box so the, the camera don't pick it up. Made in China. <laughs> so, I mean, all these countries that tell you that you must be competitive, they are protecting their markets. And I think WTO does provide for a small amount of protection. Um, and that's why IMF has been working with us in that, um, that line. Goats, excellent. Rabbits, small stock on a whole. And you know, the world is tearing away from the big cow, the elephant. I mean, you know why? In terms of climate change, <laughs> when these animals fart, they are contributing to the structure of the ozone layer. <laughs> no, it is true. <laughs> so FAO would not be pushing you <laughs> because the land, <laughs> the land it takes to grow one cow for one year could grow maybe 20 goats. You know what I saw in Costa Rica a few years ago? They were changing from beef. And when you went near to the fence and look, nice green grass, and the things come up and eat the grass, they said that meat is so much better than the beef. Iguanas. Iguanas eat grass, and it's better quality meat than you get from beef. One, one that would be ideal for our youths to work with is honey. So the capital to start bees is not too rough. And the time they take to multiply, and you can make several more boxes, is shorter. And the labor is less because it's the bees that is doing the work. All right? So bees would be an excellent one to look at. One that we're not paying enough attention, and if you compare all the conversion ratios, how many pounds of feed a cow or a bull must eat to produce a pound of beef, how many pounds of feed a chicken must eat to produ produce a pound of meat, the best of them all is fish. As little as one and a quarter pound of food can produce a pound of fish. We are joking with that one. And if, if we don't realize, and if we accept that climate change is real, and we have two meters, or a meter sea level rise, you could easily plot inside you and tell me which plains won't exist anymore in Jamaica. Look at all those areas where you're driving beside the sea. And if we have a one meter rise, 
those lands will no longer exist. So we need to start thinking. Right now, I'm working with two primary schools and a high school. And what we're doing is converting their greenhouse. Matter of fact, it's built from scratch to do that. So we put up on liner on the floor that is slope, 1% slope. We put on some gravel. We put on some sand. At the front of it, we have two big holes that we put the big vats in. And we pump that water on that six inch of sand. It slowly goes down, gets back where the fish are. And the cycle continues just like the, just like the land. We are now investigating the possibility of adding organic nutrients to the plants that will not affect the fish to see if we could boost production. Because really, it takes some time for the fish to pass out enough waste to provide enough nutrients to grow like a tomato or a sweet pepper. Mm -hmm. For lettuce, lettuce, it's quite easy. But a lot of people talk about aquaponics and are talking about some of the other food crops that we are eating. And we have to face that reality. I said to a, couple, a group some years ago that should we lose all that level land, the people who own those lands up in Christiana must expect a fight because we're coming up to take it from them. So we need to start learning different things there. And aquaculture is very important. In six months, on the 7th of March this year, 7th of February, I put in 5,000 tilapia, less than an inch. And six months after, I had tilapia weighing a pound and a quarter, a pound and a half. And if you recognize that there are other fish, not just tilapia, in case of the tilapia, it eats both, it's a herbivore and a carnivore. There are other fish that just eat like the grass carp, just grass. So all of these places that we look and we see, and that's preparation for when that land becomes water. Right? So we need to start teaching our people and looking in that direction just now and some of those things that could be done. Um, Non-traditional exports is what is really carrying the swing for us now. And one thing that has changed here, when we sold sugar, whom did we sell it to? Tate and Lyle. Who is Tate and Lyle? So we were producing and sending it back to the motherland, but for them to make money, not us. When we produce the yam and the sweet potato, and our people up there eat it, it's us Jamaicans that are making the money. And slowly it is changing. It used to be the Italians that control that market fully. But we are learning better. So we have people in Jamaica. We have relatives over there. It goes to them. And the importer is no longer telling us, oh my God, it's spoiled. Right? So we are getting better there. And yellow yams. And I wish my friend all the luck and willing to give him all the help I can. But can you imagine 40,000 pieces of yam weighing two pounds each to the right shape and size that you want it? That's what is going to do it. And you look across Jamaica and you ask the question, why is chula and the yellow yam so nice? There's nowhere else in the, in the world that I have been where in half an hour you can move from sea level to 2,000 feet. Nowhere else. That unique microclimate is why our produce are so healthy and are so good. There's no doubt about that. So it is the air, the soil, and the water that we have. So we need to protect it. We mentioned pineapple. Another new kid on the block, castor bean. Castor oil. Doesn't need a lot of land to grow, depending on the acreage that you want to do. But castor bean definitely is one of the crops to look at. Um, cassava, we're doing cassava for red stripe. But you need to do like 10 acres to really make money from cassava. 
but it works. Less pests and disease, and all your crop is sold. You know where it's going. Bamboo. I should tell Madam Forrester that I just finished my two first bamboo cabins. So but we need to do more in terms of treatment and how to get that thing working right. We, we, we're wasting time on it too long. But I talked to a lady who has just completed putting her oven for bamboo charcoal. And the bamboo charcoal is actually hotter than that from the logwood and other plant. Yep. So, bamboo. The, log cap, the bamboo cap is that I built. I harvested the bamboos roughly a year and a half ago. And there is now more bamboo we are harvested those and years before. You get like two bamboo replacing every one that you harvest. It's fascinating. And you don't have to cut down that root. You simply reap just the material ones and it's amazing what happens in just one year. And bamboo not just for charcoal. We could go to the high end of the business where we'll be earning millions. Activated charcoal. And it's for, for human beings, for the, all the distilleries, in terms of the beer, the rums, in industry. Mm -hmm. true, true, so true. what the guys want us to do is to reap our bamboo, bail it up and sell it to them, and they make the money. We need to find a way of Jamaicans producing activated charcoal so we make some of the money. Cannabis. I don't know many people have looked at that. My take on it, if you are not yet out there producing some good quality and people know that your stuff is good, it's going to be hard to get in there. If it's just for smoking, it's going to be very tight in terms of making money. But the other level in terms of medicinal purposes, and if it's, I'm happy that the laws are the way they are, in that if you are in the cannabis business and the Jamaican must have 51% of the business. So that some of that stays here. Unfortunately, some of our brothers and sisters have sold out their 49, their 51%. And it's the 49% that is running it and everything can go abroad. So we need to look at that carefully. But without a doubt, as I say again, our climate is special. Can you imagine? a greenhouse in the hills of Manchester producing cannabis at that, um, that cool nighttime temperature. Powerful stuff. So <laughs> definitely. <laughs> <laughs> so I have started to look a little at agritourism. So I said, since last December, I've been doing that full time. So what I've done it's on 15 acres of land. The river surrounds it for about 1,000 feet. With the little knowledge that I've had in agriculture, I'm planting 12 different crops, just one square chain of each. So we start out with chocolate, cocoa. Where it comes from, where it originated, economic importance worldwide, and gathering all the best practices to produce cocoa. A CXC student or a, somebody doing agriculture in a temperate climate and want to know about tropical agriculture could come and learn all about that. Nice. I have six different um, varieties of pineapples, nine different varieties of bananas, 12 different varieties of sugarcane, 12 different varieties of yams, and I'm trying to get to 26. Mm -hmm. 23 different sweet potatoes. We'll demonstrate why it's called a banana walk. Yeah. Why is it that your bananas should be pruned and pruned properly, and it goes right back to our everyday life? A grandmother should not be taking care of a child every day. So you prune to have the mother, the daughter, the granddaughter, and you, 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 all the crop care that the, the plant needs. Some varieties are tolerant to leaf spot, 
others are not. We have the one arm bandit as a planting. Mm. We have the horse planting and the maiden planting and the difference between all of them. So I'm hoping that will spin. You can kayak, you can go rafting. We want the produce that is produced in the community. Like we see crayfish as a serious you know, item from the Grace River that the community could learn how to grow baby crayfish and supply it to a bigger entity. Because when, when freshwater fish is being sold for $400 per pound, crayfish is at $1,000 per pound. And instead of just raping the river one time a year when it's dry time, we could have crayfish production all year round. There are some challenges in that I understand that the temperature of the water is one of the limiting factors why, like the farmer that was doing the Red Claw in St. Catherine, gave up. But technology is available today using geothermal cooling. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Going 20 feet below the Earth's surface, that maintains a constant temperature. We could use that to cool a greenhouse and do things like those. So th that's where my mindset is just now. And that's the direction I'm heading. And, well, I don't know. You might just pay me a visit one day. <laughs> <laughs> there are serious risks in agriculture. A farmer gets a good crop once every three years. Be it because of the weather, drought, rain, pest and disease, or the market, or gluts, whatever. He gets two foot posts. He gets a perfect crop once every five years. That means he doesn't have to put back anything. He doesn't have to go back to the bank to plant the crop again. So one in a five year, a perfect crop. One every three years, a good crop. We need to reduce that to have a reasonable crop every year. What will do it? Insurance. And some of the insurance companies are now selling crop insurance, although expensive, it's 10% of the value. But it's important and treat it just like your fertilizer or anything that you have to put into the farm. The other one, of course, is water. You must have irrigation. Climate has changed, and you need to harvest enough water to water during the dry season. As for most of that part of the island, it's interesting that November to April is dry. So there's hardly any rainfall. So there's going to be less insect problem. Might be a little more disease problem, but because the moisture is not there, you're also much better off. But guess what? No hurricane. So it will be excellent. What is the limiting factor? Water. water. Yep. Yep. And yet, water, to put in water, is just about one Jamaican dollar per gallon. It can pay for itself in one year. So I like Minister Charles' suggestion. Senator Charles, and I would love everybody to go home and read up Aqua Boy. Aqua Boy. It's nothing more than condensation. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. So what you're actually doing, you take a bottle of water from the fridge, and you put it out on the table. No water comes out of the bottle, but the entire table is wet. Oh. So for agriculture, we need to we can use that directly. For home consumption, we'd have to do some treatment and filtering. So and when you think of areas like even up here, there are gazillions of gallons of water in the atmosphere that can be used for agriculture. Matter of fact, if the humidity drops a little, it will be good for the very crops that grow because that's why they have disease conditions because there's too much moisture. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> Lots of information. Hi, um, good afternoon. Um, my question is around, you mentioned bamboo. Is there any 
um, support mechanisms for startup or concept, concept stage entrepreneurs around the bamboo sector because you had a lot of information there. Um, and my second question is uh, to, and I'm not sure if Ms. Um, Headley could answer this, but you mentioned um, a costing um, a site on your MICA um, thing. Does it have any costing re-honey? Because I heard you mention um, beekeeping. Um, and is there any research from the forestry department in terms of our in locally indigenous stingless bees, for example, that are locked in our forests? The Bureau of Standards, yeah. and that, is that in my calf? Yes. Yeah. They have a bamboo commu I mean, committee, JMIC, JBMIC, that, that's been looking at bamboo use and possibility and potentials looking for- Looking for true. <laughs> I was about to say for a while, <laughs> but um, within that group, even though you don't hear much about them, there are persons who are doing stuff, producing. What I don't get from them is a uh, quick enough yeah. take up of the bamboo. Because persons think you have to go and plant bamboo. You don't. We have about 67,000 hectares of bamboo in Jamaica currently. When, you do the, when we did the land use survey in 2013, we did the report in 2015, we can tell you where bamboo is located. And the, the only question now is on whose land? Yeah. Whose land? But, but on government land, we, we, we have a fair amount of bamboo because as forestry, Bamboo isn't really classified as a forest. So, Invasive. but we can tell you where the bamboo is in the area that, that has forest. So we are, we have been trying to encourage the Bureau of Standard and that group. We know where bamboo is. We want you to come in and take that bamboo. Because we, you, you don't really need to go and plant. So the, the bamboo is not a supply issue. It's actually access and utilization. I don't think we are doing anything on the stingless bee. It's like we don't want you to go in and take all the orchids either. Mm -hmm. Keep them there and probably work with them from that thing. Or you could probably look ahead and try and create a similar ecosystem in the area. But you know, to get to that forest ecosystem, we're going to go in layers. Because mm -hmm. you probably will have to plant something that is not suitable mm -hmm. to, the, to the bees, but then it's going to create the ecosystems, other plants will grow, which will then be suitable to the bees. So mm -hmm. it might be a step-by-step -step over the year process to look at that. But if you if we can't work on them in there, we will have to recreate the ecosystem outside. Well, let, let me hope that um, JBDC can help with that part of it. But the truth be told, as I understand it, there's even funding identified to help with bamboo but when they check, it is not gazetted. Neither is castor oil. So they can't support these crops from the ministry. They are not in the books wherever they are supposed to be as crops to be grown in Jamaica. You said you received notifications, reprices of um, produce based on where it is. Is that Market. what you said? How do you get access to those notifications? It's on the Ministry of Agriculture website, Jamis. So you go online and you find it. Oh, so it's not necessarily a notification per se? No, well, okay. you'd have to make that arrangement yeah. with the marketing division, mm -hmm. give them your email address, and they'll send it to you every week. Okay. Mm -hmm. right? um, but it's on the website nonetheless. Okay. My second right? question was regarding the companies that you said assist you. You said that if you're doing, here we go, if you're doing tree crops, there are companies that will actually assist you by providing... Um, they provide assist assistance, sorry, such as equipment and even help you in terms of getting crops turned into flow and such. No, that, that is Trees That Feed. It's an international organization. Trees That organization. What? Trees That Feed. Trees That Feed. So you go online, Trees That Feed, tell them where you are, and you can take it from there. Trees yes. That Feed. Yeah, and they have a local setting. Yes, that. yeah. In other words... It's not just a tree, but you get bread food. You get um, Ota E.T. apple. So it's a food crop. Uh, my question is in relation to start-up youth aspect of your presentation. How is it you are going to advocate 
for youth involvement or youth engagement in the process of agriculture and tying it in with agritourism? Well, the last part might be a little more difficult, um, but the, and I did ask the ministry, I called in and I said it's okay, but you can get assistance this year for youth, especially women, interested in potatoes. So they will ask, provide you with solid assistance if you are in those areas that potatoes are being planted. And here is the other program. And yeah, yeah. yes. So you talk to your local RAD officer or call the, the ministry and they'll give you that information. They didn't want to say too much about onions because it's more difficult. But my, my, my suggestion to that is simple. Just like you treat potatoes, treat onions. You need to protect it every week. And if you know to do potatoes, and you give onions that treatment, only other thing I would say, one of the things people are running away from is, to, is for transplanting. And they try every time, and they fail again and again. Matter of fact, in some countries, they don't plant from seeds at all. They plant from seeds. So they're actually planting a baby onion. So once you start growing, they stop it, store it, keep it for a long period of time until they're ready for it, and you plant them like a grain of corn or peas. So the, the time in the field is shorter, mm -hmm. and you get quicker onion production. I believe in the sets or the transplanting, based on all oh, whether you imagine you irrigate your onions today, you just finished planting, you irrigate them, and they start germinating, and you get a heavy shower rain. Everything sink. You're in trouble. Matter of fact, under the project that I was working with, we went as far as brought in equipment that you can walk behind and they transplant onions. So it can be done. Uh, good evening, everybody. My name is Kevin Scott. Um, I wanted to ask you more about your agro-tourism facility. Like, what size is it? Like, how many cottages are rooms? And how is it that you no, I are have, marketing it? I have just started so I'm, I'm picking the lower hanging fruits first as i say i started literally just more than a year because i was working before okay. so now i have time so i've started the agriculture part that i know best and now growing through the what you call them now the hurdles mm. of getting that nefa certification oh. <laughs> because the river is there in terms of a sewage so it, system yeah. that all. is the major challenge that we are mm working to solve just now. I think oh. you could try your Airbnb experience for that. Because I, I do some Airbnb stuff, mm -hmm. so that is why I wanted to find out we are at that. So ready for you. The question I would like to ask is about a device that um, I developed, a ceramic device that is supposed to aid in irrigation. I've been for a long time now trying to access funding in terms of um, being able to produce it on a larger scale than a currently can have a capacity issue. Are there any agencies related to agriculture or any other agency that would assist in that process? Because it is far more um, efficient than drip irrigation because what happens is that the water gradually releases into the soil from the ceramic gourd as opposed to a constant dripping which even though it is a small drop, it, it, it accumulates over time and you, you're losing a lot of gallons of water that way. And I've not been able to access funding. I've just been hearing it. We have been doing tests, and people have been saying it's a great idea. But um, the reality of really engaging agencies locally and, and actually accessing funding has been almost like a waste of time sometimes. You know? so, and, and you're always hearing that, oh, money is not really the issue. Nice. But when you are supposed to buy furnaces to produce all of these things, equipment to produce them at a mass rate, money is an actual issue. Okay, so what I will suggest, Wasari, um, is the DBJ has an Ignite program which is built on innovation. So it's really about packaging that plan into an innovative business idea and pitching it to them for that funding. That is one source that I know of. And that's 
possibly an area that you could look into. And, and you're right beside JBDC here. What would be your cost to do, say, one acre of this? One acre? What would be sort of cost we'd be looking at for an acre? Say vegetables. It would cost a farmer about $1.5 million per acre. Drip irrigation is about roughly 1,000 US per acre. That's about 140,000. But in terms of climate issues and saving water and water retention, the ceramic object would outlast all of us in yeah. terms of longevity. So it will pay for itself over time, just like solar. If you are a f small farmer and you don't really have the um, wherewithal to see all the amazing technology, simple technology that can be used for harvesting whatever crop would have to um, cut, cut your fruits, harvest your fruits on trees or in the ground. There's no real company in Jamaica that sells these simple but amazing technology that makes your life easier. So I'm not sure how is it that maybe the JBDC could advocate for um, small Startup enterprises business, yeah. for, for, for that kind of, um, you know, allowance for you to bring in some of these more innovative things that are happening in different countries. And it's a simple technology that we can use to make our lives easier. Because if you are involved in, if you have done farming, it is very hard. And especially where it comes down to labor, you know that there's a big issue where that is concerned. Jamaican people don't really like to work. So <laughs> you need something to replace that. So I don't know whether it can be advocated from a JBDC standpoint or persons can think about starting to import um, these simple but effective technology for far farming tools so we can move the production. So persons who actually want to farm cannot sit down and wait on a farmer to come and help dig the yam. Just to respond, ensure that you are in fact communicating with us so that we can know what to lobby for. So it's important to keep that information coming into us so that we can say even in terms of numbers, what are we looking for in terms of the amount of farmers that need this kind of lobbying. And maybe it's how it is packaged and if we really know. But because like in parts of St. Elizabeth, peanuts are reaped by teams going around and they charge for the service. You have half an acre of peanut to reap, a crew comes in, reaps it, and they charge you. We started a small project for spraying because we were concerned that the lady spraying could get affected with the chemicals they are using. Mm -hmm. The man, they're driving the same taxi with the same pesticide clothes. The clothes is washed with the baby clothes, things like that. So we started a spray team. So the cost of equipment, instead of buying five pumps, one for each person, one person could provide the service and pay for the others. And it started off fairly well. And we're hoping, matter of fact, rather even bought some equipment in Manchester and was providing a service to the farmers. So service industry we're not very familiar to it in Jamaica, outside of land preparation, but I totally agree with you. It could be a good business venture. Um, as it relates to importing, we actually have individuals with the skill set. I mean, I know individuals right now who are making plotters, I mean, machines that can cut patterns in, in wood or plastic or even metal. So it's not a case where we don't have the intellectual capacity. Maybe we just need to get these guys together and put in the, mm -hmm. the, the amount. I mean, integrate all the, the factors that exist right now. Hi. I have, I have two questions. One that you just touched on, Mr. Murray, was the sprain. Um, I noticed that nobody spoke on pests and how, you know, what's the feasibility of any kind of business in that direction. The second question was around storage and logistics. Um, we had mentioned a little bit about it earlier, but especially with the you know, food war brewing, um, is there anything in place, whether by government or private sector that you know of, or any guidance you can give to that regard? Well, in terms of the pesticides, let's say if you go online and download cost of production from MyCAF, they will even tell you the major pests you're expecting and the products that are available in the market that you can 
use. One mistake that might, you might find is that they might get in trouble of putting a brand name and other companies complain that you're not promoting their product. But it is there and there's quite a bit of information and there are quite a few manuals that I know exist between the ministry and RADA that will give you the entire cost of production, major pest and disease to expect. What was the other question again? Storage. We have to be careful when we mention storage. Depends on what we want to store. In Jamaica, rainfall in Portland, central Jamaica and the west could be a little different. There are sections that grow scale in, in the east and like in the St. Elizabeth area. It's one thing to produce red peas or potatoes or you name the crop. And you have it in store. The clock keeps on ticking because it's a cost to store. And when you, when you take it out of store, you're meeting upon fresh produce. So it has to be managed properly. Matter of fact, there's one entity that went up to Coleville, rented the facility, and bought all the potatoes at like a, even 10% higher than the competition. Put it in store because they're going to make a killing. There's a cost to store. And one of the costs that people don't consider is shrinkage. You put in 10 pounds, you're not getting back out 10 pounds. You might get eight and a half. How do you account for that 15% that you don't get back out? Mm -hmm. You add the storage cost to that, and the fresh produce is being sold for less than you have stored it and you have lost far. And that's happening in potatoes and many crops. So unless the, there's an enabling environment, like what the government was doing, we are not issuing any import permit until the local production is finished. You could get some serious burns. And I say, nothing stored is as good as fresh. So you have to be careful. But quickly, a few years ago, all the major buyers in Jamaica for potatoes fought over the facility at Coleville yeah. that could hold two million pounds of potato. <laughs> yeah. Right? And after people saw that the government was serious and really in business, we now have maybe twice that capacity built by the private sector. Golav in Saab has done it. Glastonbury has done it. Um, I was even more proud of a female farmer, Igla, that put up a storage to hold more than one million pounds of potatoes mm. in Kingston. So we have seen significant increases. Why? Because there's a market and the system was operating. And the same story that can store potatoes can store onions. So that's not a problem. So but we have to be very careful of what we store to make sure that the cost of storing plus whatever we lost in terms of shrinkage, the fresh produce we can still make money. Yeah. I have a question regarding food wastage. I think that's my main thing. Um, and I'm really interested in drying fruits and the linkages that can be formed between probably farms, markets, for persons who are interested in the processing part, not necessarily because fine, like Ms. Headley is saying, for me to start planting fruit trees, a mango tree, mm -hmm. different trees, that's going to take years, mm -hmm. right? But there are many persons or farmers that are out there that, are, that have gluts, that have lots of fruits, vegetables, different things going to waste, and we're doing nothing about the actual waste. We're not putting them into making byproducts mm -hmm. or actually thinking about, it doesn't necessarily have to even be for the Jamaican market, right? I think we also need to think larger, right? We can think about sending these products abroad. We can think about disasters. When there are disasters, dehydrated fruits, dehydrated vegetables are in demand, Right, so my thing was, is there anything that's currently happening? Are there any linkages that can be formed with somebody who has interest in the actual processing part 
but needs the actual products. Hi. Right, well, the first thing I was going to suggest that is you come, come down and come link us <laughs> at um, technical services to make sure that the product that you're developing in terms of the dried product and so on, we have um, food technologists and so on down there to help you to f make sure that that is right, first of all, and the business model around it is correct. That is very important. Even as you look at now establishing your backward linkages, and again, we can help to facilitate that as well through the same, because we're, in, on the, we're sister agents at Tirada and so on, and they have um, a mapping of all the fruits um, that are being produced and all the products that are being produced and so on. I believe it's on the website, just the same. And the strategic linkage you now with the right person, again, we can help with that. So I'm suggesting that you link us to help, us, help you to generate those linkages. Zane? Um, I could comment on that. So, if you look at the first world countries right now, for example, the Netherlands, um, none of their food waste is wasted. Although what you're doing with it is not something that the Jamaican culture would do. They basically feed it to worms slash maggots and then it's used as meal. So they eat it back. I mean, we could use it as fish feed, for example. Right? So, Truly, you know, in nature, the model that nature is built on is a no waste stage model. It's a circular economy right through. And that's in this fourth industrial revolution. I mean, that's the way we should be going. Yep. Everything should be accounted for. There should be no leakage along the pipe. Okay, I had a question regarding the, the sort of startup cost where technology is used. Um, that you spoke of earlier, Yankee. Um, what's the typical sort of startup costs? I honestly don't have the answer for that. However, what I could say is that um, for me, in terms of implementing technology, I would use a phase system because we are not accustomed to the, the, the high tech just yet. And then technology really makes sense based on the scale of production. So if you're not at a certain scale where you need that efficiency, then it's kind of pointless to, to be using high-tech for this small-scale operation. You use high-tech when you scale up and then the human labor becomes inefficient and the factors are too much for you to really rely on human input. So that's why you need the tech. And, and I mean, time is the biggest factor. Um, you, you don't want to be in a factory washing yams with, with brush anymore because when you export you're likely to have you know damage and so forth so you want to get it to the stage for example where i'm going is to produce this thing in a control system where you can account for all the quality from the get-go and you're able to cut off all the expenses along the value chain in essence you're saving yourself you know, the losses that you would have incurred by just doing the thing as efficiently as possible. So with the technology, you can get it to be as efficient as possible, getting the best quality and getting the best value in terms of your income. Thank you. Wow, that is a lot of food to take in. <laughs> I, I really want to say a big thank you to our panelists for con their uh, you know, enormous contribution to the discussion this afternoon. I think we have clearly established that there are numerous opportunities in agriculture. We're not just talking at the at the farming level, but all the logistics, the storage, the equipment. There are so many parts to the moving machine. And so um, we certainly hope from the JBDC's perspective that the mines are ticking and, and we'll be having some businesses being formed from this conversation. Also, in terms of what the Ministry of Tourism is doing to ensure that we are in fact benefiting more from the persons visiting and we have to feed them, we have to feed ourselves and it's the same discussion. And so, on behalf of the JBDC, we want to really thank you for coming this afternoon and certainly hope that you will be, you know, thinking it through. We are there for you when you are ready to start up those businesses. 